Okay. Um, let's get started. Morning. Thirty-six A. Are we thirty-six A? Somewhere between ten and fifteen lines down. We're about uh, five lines from where it uh, uh, after it gets wide. So five okay. lines from after it gets wide. First word um, on the line is Hef said. We are up to where it says Tanan in parentheses. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Tanan, which is really supposed to be Tanya, was taught in a brisa. Lo yishal shalim bechevel bachalonos, lo yiridem derech sulamos. So it was taught that um, um, it was taught that um, when we chachamim, when the chacham allowed um, a person to lower his uh, his fruits from his roof. Um, through the skylight, in order that they should be um, that they should be saved from being ruined in the rain. So that was only the skylight that's on his roof. But they did not allow him to lower them in a basket into a window um, or to take them uh, down a ladder, um, because Rashi explains that that is already too much effort involved. So the Chacham did not permit um, that much effort. They only permitted the effort involved in simply tossing them down to a skylight, but not to lower them in a basket or a side window um, or to take them down a ladder. Hasa Amai, what's the halacha regarding Shabbos where we permitted him to bring bales of hay uh, for people to sit on? <clears throat> so perhaps you could say that on Yom Tov, when it comes to saving his fruits from the rain, so there the Chacham forbade him from, uh, from investing too much effort because um, there's no, it has nothing to do with learning Torah, right? It's not coming for the, uh, for the sake of learning Torah. It's for the sake of him saving his fruits. However, when it comes to Shabbos, that uh, there is the loss of Torah learning that's involved. So perhaps there the Chacham would even permit him to invest significant effort um, in bringing these bales of hay for the uh, students to sit on. Odilma, um, uh, Amritlo, perhaps I could claim the uh, the exact opposite, right? If on Yom Tov, where there's a significant financial loss, nevertheless the Chacham forbade him from uh, invest, investing significant effort. So Hasam, the Leka Hefsid Peros, Lo Kol So when it comes to Shabbos, that uh, there's no financial loss involved. Right? We're talking about him bringing bales of hay for people to sit on. Right, so uh, if we don't allow it, it doesn't incur any financial loss. Simply, people will have to stand. Right, so um, so there, um, certainly, we're not going to permit it. Teku and the Gemara leaves this as an open question. Right, um, we cannot prove either way. Okay, there's no proof uh, regarding Shabbos whether or not he would be permitted to bring um, the bales of hay, even in a manner which involves effort. Teku again. Okay, yeah, so the Gemara leaves it as an open question. Okay, we're up to Umechasin Esaperos, about 10 lines um, from where it, uh, down from where it gets wide. Umechasin Esaperos is there by the two dots. So the Gemara is going to explain the statement of the Mishnah um, that said that even though, even in cases where we don't permit a person to, if he doesn't have a skylight to put his fruits down, right, to save them from the rain, he's allowed to take a tarp and uh, and drag it over his fruits in order to save them from the rain. So, um, and that was permitted even on Shabbos, right? So uh, taking the fruits down from the skylight, that was permitted only on Yom Tov, but covering it uh, with a tarp is permitted even on Shabbos. Amar Ula. So Ula interprets the Mishnah to say, Bafilo avira delivni. So Ula says that this halacha would even apply to bricks. So if he has bricks that are set aside for construction, 
And if he leaves them out in the rain, they're going to weaken and crumble, and they won't be uh, they won't be able to be used. They'll be ruined. So here too, says Ula, he would be permitted to take a tarp and to cover them over um, in order to in order to save them that they should not get ruined. Uh, Rav Yitzchak, Amar, Rav Yitzchak, however, disagrees, and he says Peros um, Haruyin. Rav Yitzchak says that this halacha only applies to um, fruits which are um, ready for consumption. So the fruits which are ready for consumption, um, and therefore they are not muktza. They're something which can be used on Shabbos because they're they're prepared for consumption. He can eat them on Shabbos. So certainly they're set aside for Shabbos use, and in that case he's permitted to take a tarp and cover them so they should not get ruined, right? However, bricks which are set aside for construction, which is something that obviously can't be done, uh, cannot be done on Shabbos. So they would fall into the category of muktza, right? Or something which is set aside for an activity which cannot be done on Shabbos. And therefore it would be forbidden to move those bricks. And therefore says Rav Yitzchak even further, um, the Azdar of Yitzchak Letaymei, Rav Yitzchak then follows his own logic, his own reasoning, the Amar of Yitzchak, of Yitzchak had already stated, ain't clean nital ela ledavar and nital b'shavis. So if Yehuda says, uh, if Yitzchak, I'm sorry, says a statement that one cannot move a, a vessel for the sake of something which cannot be moved on Shabbos. Meaning the tarp, which is, which is not muktzah, there's nothing stopping him from, from moving the tarp. Nevertheless, the tarp cannot be moved for the sake of the bricks, which are muktzah, which cannot be used on Shabbos. So you're not allowed to do an activity for the sake of, um, for the sake of something which is muktza. So since the bricks are set aside for construction, right, which therefore renders them muktza, then one would not be allowed to move them on Shabbos, which even Ula would agree to that halacha. You're not allowed to move the bricks. Therefore, says Rav, uh, Rav Yitzchak that you're not allowed to move the tarp to cover the bricks, right, because you're doing an action for the sake of the bricks, which are muktza. So you're not allowed to even use something else um, for something which is muktza. Ula again disagrees. Ula says that he's permitted to cover them with the tarp because the tarp itself is not muktza, right? And therefore, there's nothing stopping him from covering them with a tarp. Um, okay, Tanan, Machasinus Aperos Bekelem. So the Gemara is going to debate this uh, statement of Rav Yitzchak, and we're going to see whether we have proof um, against Rav Yitzchak's statement or not. So Machasinus Aperos Bekelem. So the uh, the Gemara questions the Mishnah, right? Our Mishnah, which we just had, right? Our Mishnah says you can cover fruits with uh, with a vessel, like with a tarp, right? Now that seems to indicate Peros in Avira Delivni Lo, right? The Mishnah stated fruits, right, which are something which is edible on on uh, on Shabbos or Yamto. That seems to indicate that only the fruits. So it seems to be a proof to Rav Yitzchak that only fruits can be covered. But bricks used for construction cannot be covered. So says the Gemara, um, Lo, who are afilo avira delivni? No, this halacha would apply even to the bricks. But I did the tonaresha mishilin peros, tona seifanami mechasinus aperos. So the reason why we stated this is because um, it's based on the first statement of the Mishnah. The first statement of the Mishnah was that on Yom Tov he's permitted to lower the fruits through the skylight. That would only apply to the fruits, not to bricks. And therefore, in the second case of the Mishnah, when it comes to covering, um, there too we stated fruits, even though the halacha would apply to bricks as well. Tanan, we learned in the Mishnah, kade yayin, kade So um, we said that this halacha applies to barrels of wine and barrels of oil, that they too can be covered with a tarp. Now, what is the case? What type of barrels are we dealing with? Betivla. So it must be that we're referring to barrels of wine or barrels of oil, which are tevel, meaning trumot or mice that have not been taken from them. And therefore, they, would, uh, they may not be eaten on Shabbos. So meaning they are muktzah. And nevertheless, we're allowing them to be covered with a tarp. Hachinami mistaba says, it's logical that we must be referring to barrels which are tevel. The isalka daita kadeyayin bekade shemen deheteira because if we're referring to barrels which are permitted to be to be consumed on Shabbos mm. or Yom Tov, because they are true and the have already been taken, Hatanel Eresha Peros. Right? We already learned in the earlier case that fruits which are ready for consumption can be covered. 
right? So why would the Mishnah have to say, and so too, barrels of wine or barrels of oil? It should be obvious. Why would I think otherwise? There's no chiddush involved. Why would I think that you cannot cover them if they are, uh, if they are ready for consumption? So it must be that we're referring to, it must be that there's an added chiddush, and that can only be if we're referring to barrels of wine or barrels of oil that are tevel, that are not ready for consumption, and nevertheless, the Mishnah is stating that one is permitted to cover them, even though they are mutza, and that's in accordance with Ula, um, and against the opinion of Rav Yitzchak. So says the Gemara, no, it's not a proof. No, it's necessary for the Mishnah to state the case of barrels of wine and barrels of oil, even though they are heter, even though we're referring to wine or oil that is permitted for consumption. Because I might have thought differently. <laughs> that when it comes to the fruits, they'll be entirely ruined um, by the rain. And therefore, the Chacham permitted you to cover them with a tarp. Right? Because the, the, there'll be a complete and total loss. However, when it comes to barrels of wine or barrels of oil, so even if some water gets mixed in, right, it's not going to cause a total loss. Right? It will cause uh, a little bit of a loss because uh, they'll get diluted. Right? But it wouldn't be a complete loss. So perhaps I might have thought that in that case, the Chacham did not permit him to cover them with the tarp. Right? Because uh, it's not going to, uh, there's not, a, full, there's not a, a significant loss if he doesn't do so. Okay? So therefore, the Mishnah has to say, and, and uh, the same halacha applies to barrels of wine or barrels of oil, there is a chidush, even if we're talking about wine or, um, or oil, which is permitted for consumption, because I might have thought that uh, since there's no sig significant loss, um, the, the Chacham would not have permitted it. Kamash Malan, therefore, the Mishnah has to teach me that halacha. So therefore, there's no proof against the Yitzchak, because we're not referring to oil or wine, which is mukta. We're referring to oil or wine, which is permitted. Um, and therefore, there's no proof against the opinion of Rav Yitzchak. He can still maintain that if it were to be tevel, if it were to be forbidden for consumption, he would not be permitted to cover them with a tarp. Tanan, we learned in the Mishnah, Nosdin Kli, Tachas Hadlaf, Bishabas. We learned in our Mishnah that he's permitted to take a bucket and place it under a leaking roof on, on Shabbos. Right? Now, uh, generally speaking, the, the Gemara's assumption is that uh, this leaking water is not something which is not something which is available for, uh, for consumption, dirty water, and therefore would certainly not be used. Um, if that's the case, it's mukta, right? And we're allowing him to take the bucket and place it under this uh, leaking water, right? So you see that you're allowed to move a vessel, right, for the sake of something which is um, mukta, even though you're going to render the bucket mukta as well. So answers the Gemara, uh, that's not a proof against Rav Yitzchak. Either Rav Yitzchak can interpret it to be bidlaf ha-ro'oi, that it is water which is leaking, but it is not uh, filthy water, it's not dirty water. Um, and Rashi says, not that it would be used for human consumption, but it could be used for animal consumption, right? And since it's permitted for a person to feed his animals on Shabbos or Yom Tov, so uh, therefore it is, it is something which is uh, going to be used for consumption. It's permitted for consumption on Shabbos and Yom Tov, and therefore it's not Muqsa. So here too, there'd be no proof against Rav Yitzchak. Okay, the Gemara is going to attempt to bring a further proof. Tashma, we learned, person machzeles, Agabe levenim bashabos. So one is permitted to take a machtelis, a, a, a fencing, and use it to cover uh, bricks on Shabbos. Right? Now, again, the Gemara's assumption is that these are bricks which are going to be used for construction. Therefore, certainly they would be mukta. And you see that he's allowed to cover them. So that seems to be a clear proof against, um, against Rav Yitzchak. And so the Gemara, the Iyatur mi binyana, the Chazil Mizga Alayu, we're referring to bricks which are left over after a construction project has ended, right? And therefore, they can be used for any sort of purpose, right? They can be used for any sort of purpose, um, including simply to, use, to be used to sit upon. So therefore, they're not mukta because they're no longer <coughs> set aside for construction. They've been left over after the project is over, and therefore, they are not mukta at all, and that's why it's permitted to cover them. Um, again, this would be Rav Yitzchak's potential um, um, Rav Yitzchak's potential interpretation, not that it has to be the case, but Rav Yitzchak can say that that is the case and therefore there would not be a proof against it. Toshma, 
Poison machzelis al gabe avonim peshavos. Um, so we have another statement, another uh, verse, which says that you're permitted to cover over stones on Shabbos. Right? Now, stones, generally speaking, stones, pebbles, um, rocks are, are mukts on Shabbos because they have no use. And something which has no use whatsoever is uh, likewise considered muksa. So answers the Gemara. So here too would be a proof against Rav Yitzchak. Answers uh, Rav Yitzchak. Ba'avonim mekurzelos the chazion lebeis akise. Um, Rav Yitzchak can interpret, again, he can interpret it to mean that it's referring to smooth, rounded pebbles, uh, which could be used for hygiene, for a person to clean themselves after, um, after, using, the, uh, after using the bathroom. So again, they have a purpose, and since they have a purpose, they would not be considered muktzah, um, and that's why it's permitted to cover them, but Rav Yitzchak can still maintain his opinion that if something was muktzah, it would not be permitted to be covered. Okay, Tashma, Horsen Machzelas Algabe Kaveres Devorim Beshabas. So one is permitted to cover a beehive on Shabbos. The Chama Mipneha Chama, or Bagishamim Mipneha Gishamim. During the summer, he's permitted to cover it for the sake of protecting it from the heat, from the sun. Um, and during the winter, he's permitted to cover the hive for the sake of protecting it from the rain. O Bavad, Shaloyiskavin, Lotsud as long as he does not have intention to trap the bees inside this cover. So answers the Gemara. Now the Gemara is saying that uh, a beehive should be considered mukta because they're live animals. There's no purpose uh, that he has to use them on Shabbos. So therefore they should be considered mukta. So again, it's a proof against Rav Yitzchak. Answers the Gemara, hasam nami de'ika devash. So um, the, the Gemara says that we're referring to a case where there is honey inside this beehive. And therefore, the hive is not considered muktzah because he's permitted to come and take the, that honey um, on Shabbos. Amar le Rav Ukva mimishon le Rav Ashi hatenach bimotzachama de ikadvash. So that's a uh, that's a fair assumption. That's a fair interpretation when it refers to the summertime when he's allowed to cover it uh, from the sun. That's a fair interpretation because uh, the bees produce honey during the summer. However, the Gemara is saying that bees do not produce honey during the winter months, and therefore, how can you interpret the uh, how can you interpret the the case to be when there's honey inside? Because there's no honey during the winter. So, answers the Gemara lo nitzricha ella laosan shte chalos. So, the Gemara says it's referring to the two combs of honey which are always left inside the hive that we always leave. Uh, the beekeepers would always leave at least two combs inside the hive um, in order that the bees themselves should have something to eat from. So answers the Gemara, So it uh, says in Gemara that uh, that's not going to answer anything because those two combs, right, we just stated, why did we leave, why are they left over inside the uh, hive so that they can be used for the bees themselves, right? If that's the case, they're not, uh, they're not going to be used for human consumption. They're going to be used for the bees Right, so they likewise would be mukta, right? They likewise would be mukta because they're not set aside for human consumption at all. Okay, so we didn't answer anything because the hive is still mukta, and uh, nevertheless, we're stating that he's allowed to cover it. So again, that would be a proof against Rav Yitzchak. So answers the Gemara, Hacha b'Maya Skinon Shechoshav Alehem. So says the Gemara, we must be referring to a case where uh, he intended before Shabbos, he stated his intention that he is, or at least he had the thought in his mind, that he's going to eat from those two combs on Shabbos, right? Now, even though normally that's not done, if he explicitly had that intention, right? So then it would take effect and uh, it would not be considered muksa. So we must be referring to such a case and therefore the hive is not considered muksa, and that's why he's permitted to cover it according to Rav Yitzchak. Now says the Gemara, avalo chashav alehem, my author, However, if you're stating that even that according to Rav Yitzchak, right, if the case would be that he did not have specific intention to eat from those combs, then it would be forbidden, right, if that's the case, which is according to what we're saying now. So, Adetani Ovavachalo Yiskavin Lotsud Liflog Velisni Bedida. So, why then did we have to have the, the opposite case? The opposing case was that uh, if he had intention, to trap the bees inside, then it would be forbidden for him to cover it. 
right? Meaning that the only potential problem that we could stumble upon would be if he has intent to trap the bees, right? But otherwise it would be permitted, right? Why did we have to say that the only problem would be if he intends to trap the bees, right? We have a much simpler issue, right? If he did not have in mind for, if he did not have in mind to eat from those combs of honey, right? Then the, the hive would be muktza, in which case it would be forbidden to cover it. So why do we have to come on to a case of trapping, right? We could have stayed with the problem of muktza itself, okay? right? And uh, we could have said that if he didn't have in mind to, uh, to eat from those two combs, then the hive is muktza and he would not be permitted to cover it, right? So why, why would the, the case have to transfer to trapping, right? Meaning the original problem was muktza. And then we said, it's not going to be muktza. The only problem would be trapping, right? We have a case, which is a problem within the realm of muktza itself. If he didn't explicitly have in mind to eat from those combs, then it would be muktza. So we could have stated, that the only time it's permitted is when he explicitly had intention to eat from those combs. But if he didn't have in mind, right, to eat from those combs, then it would be forbidden, right? So why do we have to come on to a problem of trapping? We could have uh, come on to a problem. We could have stayed with the discussion of muktza and found a problem within muktza itself. So answers the Gemara, hachi ka'amar, afal so we want to come up with a, the Gemara is stating that he should be aware of the potential issue of trapping. Even though we're dealing with a case which, where it's no longer muktza, right? nevertheless, he has to be sure that he's not going to stumble upon the problem of trapping. So you're right. We could have stated that there are many cases where it would be forbidden because of muktza itself. Okay. We could have stated that that was the potential issue of muktza. Right? But we, we wanted to point out that there's also another potential problem. We wanted to make the point that even if I find you a case where there's no issue of muktza, it has to be careful also about trapping. So therefore, that's why we, we wandered off. That's why we, uh, we, we left the realm of muktza and we uh, went over to trapping in order to make the point that he has to be aware of the potential issue of trapping. So now the Gemara is going to address this point, this very point that we just said, that he has to be sure that he does not have intent to trap the bees. Right? That was the statement that we said. And he has to be careful, he has to be sure that he does not have intent to trap the bees, which means that even if, right, it would seem to indicate that even if he does end up trapping them, as long as that was not his intention, right, then it's okay, then it would not be a problem. Right? So meaning even if he covers the beehive and by covering it, he actually traps the bees inside. Since that was not his intention, that's okay. That's not a problem. So it says the Gemara, Now, if we're stating that, that uh, if he did not have in mind to eat from the combs, then he would not be permitted to cover it, right? That must be following the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, who, uh, who, who is of the opinion that this concept of muktza exists. Okay, but there is an opinion of Reb Shimon, okay, who holds that uh, in the vast majority of cases, there is no problem of muktza, meaning he, he holds that the Chachamim did not enact this problem, this uh, halacha of muktza in the majority of cases, right? And uh, therefore, it would be permitted to cover the beehive for the, even if he did not have in mind for, um, the, for the honeycombs. So Amos Seifa, but let's transfer to the later case of Avachalo Yiskavin Lotsu, that we stated that he cannot have intent to trap the bees, meaning that if it was not his intention, even if he does end up trapping them, it's not a problem. Asan the Rab Shimon, the Amar Davashe in Miskavin Mutter. Now, how can it be that even if he is going to be trapping them, it's permitted as long as that was not his intention? That can only follow the opinion of Rab Shimon, who states that. A davar she'ein miskaven. That if one were to do a malacha, do an action which is forbidden on Shabbos, but his intent was not for the the um, the isra of Shabbos that the Torah prohibited. For example, the Gemara's case is: let's say he is uh, dragging a heavy bench, a heavy table, right, for the purposes of using the table or sitting on the bench, right. But while he's doing so, he's dragging it through the he's dragging it through 
the dirt. He's traveling, he's dragging it over um, a grassy uh, a dirt area. And while he's doing so, he is digging a furrow, right? He's plowing a furrow in the ground, right? Which is forbidden on Shabbos. It's chover, it's choresh, right? It's, uh, it's plowing. And that would be forbidden on Shabbos. And he is directly doing so, right? However, it's not his intention, right? He has no plans to then go and plant something in that furrow that he's digging, right? That's not his intention. His intention is to use the, uh, is to use the bench. According to Rabbi Shimon, that's a Dava She'in Meskaven, and it's permitted on Shabbos. Okay? Now, if we're stating that even if he ends up trapping the bees inside, it's not a problem because it's not his intention, right? that can only fit with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. Right? It's similar to the case of dragging the bench. Right? Now, um, so it must be fitting, it must be going with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, the Amad Dava She'in Meskaven Mutter. Now the Gemara says, Vitisbura. Does that answer your question? Right? Is that okay? Is it now fully understood why it's permitted to cover the beehive because we're following the opinion of Reb Shimon? Right? Vitisbura to Reb Shimon, Rava the Amri Tarvayu. Right? It's still going to be a problem because Abaya and Rava both clarified the opinion of Reb Shimon and they said, Moda Rabbi Shimon, Vipsigresha below Yamus. Right? That even Rabbi Shimon agrees that if um, he, it is a direct cause, right? His action is a direct cause to violate Shabbos, okay? And uh, Rashi says, the, the Gemara says the case is, uh, for example, that he is, um, he is cutting off the head of a chicken in order to give it to his child to play with, okay? Only uh, toys were a little different in those days. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, Toys R Us was a little bit of a different store in those days. Um, so they would, uh, they would play with a chicken there with a severed chicken head. And he is severing the head of this chicken in order to give it to his child to play with, right? Now, is his intent to slaughter the chicken for the sake of consumption, right? Or to take the life, it, more, more importantly, is his intent to take the life of the chicken? That's, that's not his intent, right? He would be just as happy if the chicken would go on living without its head, right? All he wants is the head, right? Now, however, right, uh, we certainly understand that psik ratio, cutting off the head of the chicken is certainly going to immediately result in the chicken losing its life, right? So therefore, even Rabbi Shimon would agree that such an action would be forbidden. We're not going to say, oh, well, since his intent was not to take the life of the chicken, his intent was simply to sever the head to create a toy, therefore it should be permitted. Now, even Reb Shimon's going to agree that this is considered, uh, this is considered netilas neshama. This is considered uh, killing a, a, a creature which is forbidden on Shabbos, right? And it would be forbidden even though it's not his intention, right? Now, if that's the case, right? In, in our case where he is covering the beehive and thereby trapping the bees, it's a direct cause, right? Similarly, it's a direct cause. By, by covering the beehive, he's immediately trapping the bees, and it should be forbidden, even if that's not his intention. Even if that's not his intent, it should still be forbidden, even according to the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, and it no longer falls under the category of Dava She'in Meskaven, right? It comes into the category of Psik Reisha, which is a direct cause, right? And even Rabbi Shimon agrees that that's forbidden, okay? Rabbi Shimon only maintains Dava She'in Meskaven is permitted if it's indirect. If it's not an immediate effect of the action that he's doing, yeah. Does the fact that the hive is the, the bee's home make any difference to how the case is looked at or adjudicated? I mean, it's not like they're, 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 they're trapping something when it's out about its business, and then when it's actually in its home, you know, is it still trapping? So the Gemara is maintaining that it's still considered trapping as long as there's no avenue for the bees to escape, mm -hmm. right? And he's trapping them inside, even though it's their home. Um, it's still going to be considered trapping. Yeah, that's what the Gemara is saying. It would still be considered trapping. So answers the Gemara, La Olam Kula Rab Yehudi. So the Gemara says, you're right, right? Uh, attributing this to the opinion of Rab Shimon does nothing for us because uh, Rab Shimon is not going to help us at all because it doesn't fit into the category of Dava Shein Miskavit, right? It's considered Psig Reisha, which even Rab Shimon would, be, would agree is forbidden. 
right? So there's no reason for us to then attribute this case to Rabbi Shimon. We can leave it in the uh, we can leave it in the ownership of Rabbi Yehuda, right? We can we can maintain that the entire case um, is Rabbi Yehuda speaking. Now, how do we answer this question of why is he permitted to track the bees, right? Why is he permitted to cover the beehive and thereby uh, trap the bees, right? Even if that's not his intention, nevertheless, that's what he's doing. And says the Gemara, there are, uh, there are well, we call them windows. There are other uh, ways for the bees to get out of this hive, right? So he's covering over the top of the hive so that, um, so that it shouldn't get ruined by the sun or by the rain, right? But uh, doing so does not result in the bees getting trapped, right? Because there's other ways for the bees to escape from the hive. There's other ways for them to get out. Okay? Nevertheless, we're stating that, um, so, velo tema, l'rab Yehuda ovavad shalo yiskavein latzot, but now, right, uh, the mission, the, the case no longer really makes sense, right? Because we stated that uh, as long as his intent is not to trap, right? As long as his intent is not to trap the bees, then it's permitted, right? Now, we're talking, if we, if we now are um, explaining that we're talking about a case where there's other avenues for the bees to escape, right? Then the reason why it's permitted is because he's not trapping, not because it's not his intent, right? That's not the effect either. Right? The effect is that the bees are not going to be trapped because, um, because there's other ways for them to escape. Okay, so therefore, uh, for example, right, uh, the, the Mishnah and Shabbos talks about a case where if you had an animal in a room and you close the door of the room, right, thereby trapping the animal inside, that would be considered trapping, right, if it's a large animal, right? But obviously, if there's another door, right, that the animal can, can escape from, Right, then it's not considered trapping. So similarly here, if there's other ways for the bees to get out, right, then he's not trapping them at all. So says the Gemara, you're right. And that would be the, uh, you're right. And the wording of the case really has to be a little different. The wording of the case is not that it was not his intent to trap them, but rather the wording is that um, going on to 36B uh, at the top, Ela Ema Ovavad Shalo Yasena Mitsuda. So rather the wording has to be that when he covers the hive, he has to be careful not to cover uh, all the avenues of escape, not to cover all the holes in the hive, right? It must be that he's allowing some of the holes to remain open and therefore he's not trapping. So now it no longer has anything to do with intent any longer. We're talking about the facts of the matter, right? That when he's covering it, he has to make sure not to cover all of it so that the bees can escape from other uh, from other sides of the hive, and therefore it's not trapping whatsoever, and that's why it's permitted, because uh, forget about intent, right? He's not actually causing any trapping to happen at all. So says the Gemara Pshita, right? Now, if, if we're simply discussing a case where either he's covering the hive and he's trapping them, or he's not covering the hive and he's not trapping them, so that's obvious, right? I don't need a Mishnah to come and teach me that if he's not covering the hive entirely, that it's not trapping. And I certainly don't need a Mishnah to come and teach me that he's not permitted to cover the hive entirely and thereby to trap the bees inside. That's obvious. We know that there is a, we know that there's a malacha on Shabbos of trapping. It's one of the 39 malacha. So of course he can't cover the hive and trap the bees inside. That's obvious. Why do I need a Mishnah to come and teach me that halacha? So says the Gemara, there is a Kiddush. I might've thought that it would be permitted. Why? Ma'u de tema, so I might have thought that perhaps the, the prohibition, the issue of trapping, only applies to an animal which is normally trapped. Okay, so it might be, uh, it might be uh, a deer, right? It might be uh, a rabbit, it might be a different creature, it might be a mink, whatever it might be, animals that are normally trapped, right? But bees are not normally trapped. Okay, um, they're not something which is trapped for commercial purposes, right? People don't go around harvesting trapping bees. And therefore, um, I might have thought that the entire prohibition of trapping does not apply, right? Because uh, the, the prohibition, perhaps the prohibition of Shabbos of trapping is only when he intends to use the animal. For example, the case is he's trapping a deer and then he intends to slaughter it. 
right? And then he intends to eat the meat or to use the hides. Perhaps that's the only case where it's pro prohibited on Shabbos, but trapping the bees where that's certainly not his intent and bees are not normally trapped inside their hive, um, perhaps that would be completely permitted. Kamash Malam, therefore I need a Mishnah to come and teach me that no, trapping the bees is forbidden. Right? Even though they're not normally trapped, nevertheless trapping them is forbidden and therefore he must be sure that when he's covering the hive, he's not going to trap the bees inside. Okay, um, now the Gemara is going to offer a, uh, an alternative explanation for the question of uh, the, the original question that we had of that uh, bees do not produce um, bees do not produce honey during the winter and therefore the hive should be muktza because it, it has no it's not fit for human consumption at all because there's no honey inside. So Ravashi Omar Ravashi answers Mikatani Did the mission state that we're referring to the season of the sun? the season of the rain, which would mean the summer and the winter. That's not what it said, right? What does it say? Um, right? We didn't state the season of the sun, the season of the rain. We stated the sun, right? If there is sun, which could harm it, or there is rain, which could harm it, then he's permitted to cover it, right? But biyome nisan or biyome tishrei. It can simply be referring to a case, a, a day where there is sun or a day when there is rain, right? Um, and when does that happen? That happens during the changing of the seasons, right? During the time of Tishrei, as we approach the rainy season, right? Or during the days of, of Nisan, when we approach the sunny season, right? So in that case, you could have, you could have days where there is sun or days where there is rain, but nevertheless, there's still honey that remains inside the, uh, inside the, the beehive, right? So again, right, during, you're right, during the middle of the winter, there's no honey, right? But our mission does not have to be referring to a case of the middle of the winter, right? I had said that there's rain and rain is only, only <clears throat> during the winter. No, there can be rain during the, the early, uh, during the fall, right, when the seasons are beginning to change. And that's the case that we're referring to. So again, we're only referring to cases where there is honey inside the hive, and therefore it's permitted to cover the hive because the hive is not mukta. right? If the hive is not mukta <laughs> because there is honey inside, so then, uh, then certainly it's allowed to cover it, right? But uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can interpret it, we can interpret the Gemara that uh, if, if there was no honey inside, it would be forbidden. And that would be in accordance with the opinion of Rav Yitzchak that uh, we may not cover something which is muktza. We may not move something for the purpose of something which is muktza, right? Again, not that it has to be so, but we're saying that there's no proof against Rav Yitzchak because Rav Yitzchak can interpret the case to be when there is honey inside the hive. Again, we have no proof against him because we don't have a case where we can prove that something is muktza, and nevertheless, we would allow to uh, allow ourselves to bring something else to protect it, to cover it. Okay, um, Venostin Kli, going on to the next part of the Gemara, about uh, looks to be about uh, six or seven lines down from the top of thirty-six B um, at the two dots. Venostin Kli Tachas Adlaf the Shabbos. Um, the Mishnah stated that he's permitted to place a bucket under the uh, under the leaking water on Shabbos. Tana, we learned further about this statement, im nismale hakli shofech veshone veeno nimna. Okay. Um, so let's say the bucket filled up now, right? It's a significant leak and now the bucket is full. So he's permitted to carry the bucket, go ahead and <coughs> empty it out, right? Uh, he's, uh, since he's using it to protect, let's say his, uh, his carpet, right? Obviously he doesn't want to empty it there, right? Uh, that would defeat the whole purpose. So he's going to, he's permitted to take it out, empty it down the drain, right? Um, or outside his house, and then return and put the bucket back in its place. Okay. And he does not have to be, so even though the bucket now is filled with, uh, with dirty water, with filthy water, nevertheless, he's permitted to take it out and, uh, and empty it. And we don't say that that should be a problem of muktza um, within itself by carrying the bucket. So uh, Abaye had a millstone and there was a leak over the millstone. And since the uh, millstone was made out of, uh, out of mortar, 
it, wa it uh, was beginning to crumble from the rain. So it was causing damage to the millstone itself. So Asa Lekame de Rabba. So Abaya came to his teacher, to his Rebbe, who was uh, Rabba. Amale zil aile lepuriach. Right, you can zil ayi lepuriach lahasam. You can uh, you can immediately go to um, that place, and you're allowed to take um, you're allowed to take a bucket and to uh, and to fill it up, right, and then to empty it. So the lahave kigraf shel vei because it's similar to the case of a bedpan, right, and the chachamim permitted one to take a bedpan and go ahead and empty it, right. So even though Right, the uh, that we should we would assume that the bedpan itself should be considered mukta, right? Because it is something which is filthy, something which is disgusting to a person, um, and therefore a person would not use it right for any other purpose. So therefore, it should be considered mukta. Nevertheless, the chachamim for for the sake of uh, for the sake of cleanliness, for the sake of hygiene, or for the sake of the um, real sanity. Um, yeah, aside from communal sanity, right, for the sake of, uh, of, uh, of a person's, uh, what we call kavod adam, right, for the sake of his dignity, the chachamim, for the sake of personal dignity, the chachamim allowed the, uh, the graf shalvi to be taken and emptied, and therefore, um, um, and therefore, this should be similar, that if the chachamim permitted you to empty the bedpan, they should permit you to empty the bucket. So, Yosef Abaye, Abaye did not accept this ruling because Abaye was bothered by the question. So is it permitted to, uh, to take a perfectly usable bucket and then turn it into something which is no longer usable? Meaning a bedpan, right? Something which is set aside to be a bedpan, right? Uh, is already mukt, right? Because it has no, uh, it has no use Right uh, for anything else, right? But again, because it's filthy, and therefore it's already mukt, right? So, so by by uh, moving the bedpan, you're not um, you are not removing it from you're not um, I'm sorry you're not taking it something which is mutter and turning it into mukt, right? You're not taking something which is permitted and then <clears throat> rendering it mukt on Shabbos itself, right? However, by taking a perfectly usable bucket, right, and now placing it under the leak, you are taking something which was usable, it had many different purposes, right, and uh, now by placing it under the leak, you are rendering it muktza on Shabbos itself. So Abaya says, is that permitted to be done? Right, so he questioned the validity of Rabba's, Rabba's ruling, right, of Rabba's precedent, Rabba bought a precedent from the bedpan, Abaya questioned whether that's actually applicable to the case of um, of placing the bucket under the leak, um, and therefore he did not act in accordance with um, in accordance with Rabbah's ruling. He did not accept his Rebbe, his master's teaching. So So uh, while he was uh, busy deliberating, right, and debating whether or not he could in fact act in accordance with this ruling, so nafal the the uh, the millstone collapsed, right. So while Abaye was, uh, was busy deliberating, right, and debating whether or not he could follow this ruling, his millstone was ruined. Amai tesili the avre ademar. So Abaye said that uh, I got what I deserved, right? I should have accepted my, my Rebbe, my master's uh, ruling uh, without question. So since he's my master, since he's my Rebbe, I should have accepted his ruling uh, rather than debate and question and deliberate over it. And uh, therefore, I got uh, I got what I deserved by my millstone getting ruined because I did not accept um, this ruling. Okay, uh, we, okay, we'll go on for another minute. Amr Shmuel, Graf Shel Vei, Ba Avit Shel Mei Raglayim, Muter Lahotzion LaAshba, Uchshel Machziron No Sin Bo Mayim Umachziro. So um, Shmuel said, Graf Shel Vei, so a bedpan. Um, and uh, Rashi says these really are the two of uh, are the same. A graf shalvei is something which is used um, for defecating for feces. Va'avet shalmei raglayim is something which is used for for urine. Mutter lahotzi on la'ashba. He is permitted to take them and uh, empty them right uh, in the uh, in the in the garbage dump in the place which was used for uh, for emptying them out. So he is permitted to take them out. 
um, and empty them. <coughs> However, uh, when he wants to now no sin bomayim zero. However, when he wants to bring them back now that they're empty, so to empty them, the chachamim permitted, even though they should be muktzah, for the sake of personal dignity, right? For the sake of hygiene and the sake of dignity, the chacham allowed to, him to take them out and empty them, even though um, logically they should be considered muktzah, right? However, what allows him to return them, okay? Um, meaning assuming that he has other bedpans that he'd be able to use, right? And he doesn't actually require these on Shabbos. So um, no sin bo mayim He should fill them with water. Water is permitted to be moved on Shabbos. And since he's permitted to transfer the water, to carry the water, he would be permitted to carry the vessel that they are in, even though the vessel itself would be considered muktza savamina, uh, graf shalvi'i agav mana in bifne atzmolo. So we see from here that Shmuel maintains that the graf shalvi'i, the bedpan, can be moved because of the water that's within it, but not for the sake of itself. Tashma, duhauach barta, the ishtakach be asparmki, durav ashi. So uh, there was a um, there was a mouse which came into the um, the uh, spices of it got into the herbs the spices of Rav Ashi and it obviously would cause damage and it would ruin them and Rav Ashi said it's permitted to grab it by its tail and remove it right even though um, it should be muktza right nevertheless it's permitted to remove it for the sake of saving the spices so you see that it would be permitted. Uh, to move something which is, uh, even though it itself should be considered mutza. Okay, we'll stop here for today. We're at the Mishnah.